Kaifu really needs no introduction. Number one, he's so well known. Number two, you already have his bio. Number three, he has 50 million followers on Weibo. The, um, he's just written this book, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. And it is truly spectacular. It's, I think it's fair to say it's a must read for two reasons. One, it's a must read because for those of us uh, who don't really understand AI, it lays out what AI is and what its future is, what we should be looking for. And number two, for those of us, especially this audience, who need to understand U.S.-China relations and where we're going to compete, where we're going to cooperate, this really lays out a vision of where both countries are going to be and a hope um, as to where we're going to go. So it's, it's, uh, it's a must read. Uh, it also is, and I was surprised at this, Kaipu, it, it's an intensely personal book. It's really, it's obvious, it's nonfiction, um, but it, it, the emotion in it is quite strong and palpable and, and takes the story, you know, what should be a fairly dry story of AI and makes it very kind of real and, and takes you through this, this world and, and Kaifu's world. But it's truly, it's a great contribution, I think, to the understanding of AI. And I think it's a great contribution to uh, U.S.-China relations by kind of where there's a lot of smoke. This actually provides light and illuminates kind of what's going on. But this should be a wonderful talk. You'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Yep. <coughs> then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, but please join me in, in welcoming Kai Fu Lee, who has done a truly magnificent job. And I'm proud to call a friend. Thank you. Thanks very much. Of course. I'm used to speaking Chinese, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for coming out on a um, near, oh, end of a work day and your dinner hour. I really appreciate your being here. Um, this is the title of a book I wanted to write. But uh, my publisher says, if you write a book, it must have the word China in it. <laughs> so <laughs> it evolved into this other book, uh, as well as a cover, which I think is my publisher's idea. But uh, I really think AI is, brings a lot of challenges, but it also brings about an era of enlightenment. So uh, instead of uh, me introducing AI, I'm going to ask uh, someone much more famous to tell you what do you think about AI? Hopefully we have audio. <laughs> <laughs> to build a better world with artificial intelligence. Wait a sec. We won't be London better, we'll be here. So <laughs> this was actually not President Trump speaking. This is um, a deep neural network uh, synthesizing his voice, <coughs> having been trained on massive amounts of his speech. So at a new level of realism, I think we're at this awakening moment where many things we before thought were not possible to do with machines now can be done. Realistic speech synthesis, uh, re speech recognition higher than speech uh, human accuracy, face recognition, uh, and also uh, uh, AlphaGo, beating human at Go, uh, many uh, new uh, cancer diagnosis systems based on reading MRIs and CTs. Uh, every day we are seeing breakthroughs in AI and the fundamental to that breakthrough is a technology called deep learning. What deep learning is, is what you see in this picture, massive amounts of data flowing in into a center, a network in the center. And that network can be thought of as a black box with mathematics inside. Because this is not a technical talk. And by the way, this is not a technical book. Um, deep learning is taking a massive amount of data and teaching it to do classification, prediction, um, uh, decision, or in this case, synthesis. So it's, um, and then you need to feed it back by telling it, this is John's face, that's Mary's face. Um, this person borrowed money and didn't pay back, this person did. This stock may grow, uh, went up today, that one went down. And by training the deep neural network with massive amounts of data within one domain, which is really important because it cannot cross domain. A speech recognizer can do just one thing. 
a lone decision maker can do only one thing. And it's a basically think of this deep learning as an amazing prodigy who can process more data than we can see in a lifetime and learn to make decisions much more accurately, accurately than we can, but within one domain. And we'll come back to this, and this is where our humanity can be preserved, because one domain is actually extremely, extremely limiting. So <clears throat> um, what, are the, what are the things this deep neural network can do? If you just stick with one domain, what can you possibly do? Actually, a lot. Uh, this slide shows you the four waves of AI. Uh, since I told you, one domain, lots of data, there was labeling. Well, the first domain is obviously internet, right? In, you browse the internet every day, you're contributing to oceans of data, and you're also, guess what, a free lab rat labeling for Amazon and Google. <laughs> because every time you buy something, you're giving Amazon a signal. Someone like me at the time like this wants to buy something like this. So if you're a user on Amazon, you probably know this over the past 10 years. Uh, would you also like to buy this has improved a lot. If you're a user on Taobao, you probably know this. It's uh, ads are much more accurate. If you're a user of Meitu, you guys use Meitu, Beauty Plus, you probably know that it, it, noticed it beautifies you a lot more than before. Why is that? Because when you take a selfie and you store it or share it, you're telling it you did a good job. If you delete it, you're saying you did a bad job. So the AI deep learning will learn to make you more like what you thought was worthy of sharing, less like what you thought was not worthy and deleting. So all these internet algorithms, they have the feedback loop labeling and they circle around and around and around and they make tons of money and that's why these are near trillion dollar companies, the Amazon, Google, Facebook, <coughs> Microsoft, and the Chinese companies, the Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Um, so actually every big internet company that has significant user base, they're all AI companies. Okay. The second wave of AI is what about other companies? Well, who else has data? Businesses have data. Banks have lots of data. Hospitals have data. Governments have data. Um, and uh, insurance companies have data. And that data can be turned into intelligence if resurrected and fed into le deep learning. A bank probably, usually, thinks about its, its a head of data storage as a cost center. So that person, when I, whenever I meet a bank and insurance company, head of IT, in the past, they always look like this beaten up person whose boss says, you know, your budget is cut, why are you wasting all this money, computer storage, you're not making money for me. It's the salespeople, product people who make money for me. You're just a cost center. But guess what? Uh, the cost center has just turned into a gold mine. Because imagine a bank that can take all of the customer transaction records and start to predict what might this user buy? And then this, the, the uh, conversion rate will go up. Uh, what kind of asset allocation makes sense for this user? Then users will make more money and so will the banking commissions. What about credit card fraud detection? What about loan approval? So all those things become more accurate once you uh, start to warehouse, store, use, apply AI for a bank. So uh, the business AI can go from banking, insurance, hospitals, governments, and so on. That's the second wave. The third wave is even more exciting because that's when it's not just big data, it's uh, eyes and ears. You've got AI that's able to see, that's able to hear. Um, it, um, your Amazon Echo, Siri, that you can talk to and understand you, suddenly can do things that it wasn't imaginable before. Because the physical world is not generally digitized, right? We don't take a video and store all the audio that happens in our house, in our home, in our school, and so on. But with AI, it can. Actually, Amazon Echo is listening to you every day. It learns a lot from what you ask it to do, but also it can hear what TV you have playing in the background, whether your room was noisy, whether there's another person talking. Sure, Amazon doesn't listen to you the whole day. It then listens to you the time you say Alexa, the, till the time you finish, plus minus eight seconds. Well, aggregated over tens of millions of people talking to it uh, you know, 20 times a day, that's a lot of data it can do stuff with. And what about um, computer vision? Um, in, the simple, in the simple examples, you know, when we go to airports, now we don't have, uh, necessarily have um, 
officers, uh, immigration officers examining our, our faces anymore. And in my company, Sanovation Ventures, um, uh, Steve was there. We don't, have, we don't wear badges. We open the door with our faces. This is Star Trek in real life. And this is not you go up there and stand there and, and wait. You just walk off the elevator. It's got a video that kind of tracks you and continuously look at you from all the angles and make sure you are who you say you are. Then you go through. And this kind of face recognition actually can be used in, I know many people think of security applications, but there are many other commercial applications. For example, credit card fraud. My, the thing I hate, two things I hate about coming to the US. One is I have to bring cash. And we'll get to that point later. <laughs> <coughs> the other thing is, I use my credit card in the US, and then because I'm usually not in the US, once I'm here and I, I buy a lot of things to bring home to China, and then, of course, the, it triggers, right? Uh, your, uh, your credit card was declined. Now you have to wait in line, call, call them up, tell them the name of your pet and what school you went to, <laughs> and finally get through. In China, uh, all payments are pretty much done by your mobile payment, and I'll get to that later. And what if there's a potential fraud? Well, it doesn't call you to ask you these annoying questions. It says, uh, take a selfie. So I take a selfie. It says, ah, that looks like Kaifu. OK, go through. And if not, it doesn't. It's incredibly efficient. Um, and you could ask, well, what if uh, I hold the picture of Kaifu and try to pretend to be him? Uh, the system is pretty smart. It would say, uh, take a right side of your face, open your mouth, smile, say something, and then uh, uh, it would pretty much be sure you are you before letting you go through. Now that's just recognizing personal faces, but that people use that example a lot, but there are so many other things you can do with uh, computer vision. If you recognize all that's going on in your store, then you can track users uh, the same way Amazon tracks users. If you wonder why retail companies are beaten up by Amazon, because Amazon knows in the back end who went to what page, clicked on what, bought what, and use all that logic to push more things you want to buy. And retail stores, what happens traditionally? They just charge you money, collect a bunch of cash, end of the day, uh, some beers are gone, some Cokes are gone. They don't know who bought what. But with, um, suddenly, with um, sensors in a store, that's for the moment accepted. We accept cameras in stores. If not, there are other sensors that can preserve your identity. But anyway, sensors that knows who went in the store, who went to which shelf, who picked up what object, and who looked at it with a smile, who looked at it with a frown, all of those things will be uh, essentially treating offline customers as though they were online, collecting lots of data, becoming more intelligent. Take that one step further, you've got Amazon Go, right? You take something, put it in your basket, put it in your pocket, it's paid for. So uh, automated stores, automated fast food. Uh, you, you've probably uh, seen um, examples of, of that. Um, we have an investment called F5 Future Store. You go in and scans your face. You tell it what you want to eat, uh, and then the food comes out. Okay, so uh, that much cheaper than McDonald's. So perception allows you to digitize the physical world of perceptual data, vision, and speech, and use it to enable new applications that weren't before possible. And then wave four is adding arms and legs. Not physically arms and legs, but the ability of movement and manipulation. That will enab enable things like um, factory automation, um, inspection, making uh, things on the assembly line. It will enable um, commercial applications such as uh, a dishwasher, uh, dishwashing robot, I mean. Um, if you had a giant dishwashing, a giant di dishwasher robot where all the food at, after each meal, you can just throw everything in with the leftover, uh, the, the dirty everything and not have to rinse anything and just push a button, everything out comes out sanitized and clean. Uh, would you like that? If, okay, so I'm taking orders after the session. <laughs> it's uh, $300,000 each. Uh, so who still wants one? <laughs> Nobody. But there are restaurant owners who will want it because for them, they have five dishwashers and they amortize this over a year, year and a half and it's worth it. And then it will get cost reduced over time. Eventually, you'll get your $2,000 version for your professional or home kitchen. So um, you know those robots, robots for picking fruits, robots for agriculture, uh, and then of course autonomous vehicles. Uh, autonomous vehicles are much more than just um, uh, a button on a Tesla that's uh, autopilot. Autonomous vehicles will, uh, plus electrical vehicles and shared sharing economy, 
will get us a car anytime we want it, take us to wherever we want to go. And um, it will save us a lot of money because no longer do we have to buy a car. A car is the worst investment that you've ever made because it's sitting there depreciating 96% of the time. 4% of the time, you're driving it, it serves you a function, but if Uber could be there in 30 seconds, uh, very safe, very clean, uh, never with a discourteous driver, because there's no driver, <laughs> uh, you would use it and save a lot of money. It would actually be healthier for the environment. There would be fewer such cars, because they can be strategically AI planned to be where people might need it and to take them where they need to be. They'll be better for the environment because they'll be electrical and not pollution. Um, they'll be safer because AI gets better with more data and then the, the AI car gets safer, safer by collecting more data and training, not just on you, the passenger, but all passengers in all of the United States or all of the world. So it's learning on more data, iterating, and it will be an IoT, uh, Internet of Things, connected together so that two cars can miss each other by one centimeter. Uh, we'll think it's close, but we won't be able to do it. Uh, but cars will be safer. More lives will be saved. Uh, and then next, we'll not be allowed to drive because we'll be the largest hazard to ourselves at that stage. Um, and uh, you're, it's just like we can't ride horses on interstate highways, right? <laughs> However, the good news is if you want to ride horses, you can still go to farms. And if you want to drive cars in the future, you can still go to you know, car farms. <laughs> <laughs> So that will be the future. So hopefully you've seen the future. Four waves, and this is not, how many waves will there be? There'll probably be 20, 30 waves, who knows? If you roll back time to 1996 and ask Kaifu, how many internet waves will there be? I would not be able to tell you the waves that we actually experienced from websites, browsers, uh, portals, um, uh, search engines, ads, games, e-commerce, uh, what else is there? Online to offline um, and mobile, right? And all of that within mobile. That's a dozen revolutions right there. Uh, maybe 15 if you count all the evolution of all the steps again. So 15 revolutions just within internet. But in 1996, I'd be lucky if I named four. So we're really just at the very beginnings. At the same time, these waves will have huge impact on, on humanity. These will, each wave might be five to 10% of our GDP added. They might be 5 to 10 percent of human workforce reduced. So a little bit on, since this is hosted by the committee, I talk a little bit about U.S. and China. Um, I will conclude this is not a war and not a zero-sum game, but let me make the comparisons because you all want to know who's ahead. So U.S. is way ahead in um, research. These are the top scientists in the world, zero Chinese on the list. They're all Americans, a few Canadians. And U.S. not only led in uh, AI, U.S. led in pretty much all of technology. Uh, from the days of Windows and Intel, Silicon Valley has uh, made the whole world revolve around it. But a, a big thing happened about 10 years ago, and that was that the Chinese miracle. In the last 10 years, because China had such a huge market at the top and then going clockwise, that attracted a lot of investment and money, that trained a lot of smart VCs, who funded a lot of tenacious entrepreneurs, who built a lot of great companies that had a lot of great products that attracted more users. And then the loop continued and continued as China went from 150 million users to 800 million internet users. As China went from an internet total valuation, that's 1 of US, to today, about one to one to the US. So that miracle happened. This is all pre-AI. And, and the capabilities of these companies have gone up in three very big, unbelievable steps in the last eight years. Even 10 years ago, on the left blue side, were the copycats. You could go to China and, and could tell your American friends, oh, that's the Google of China, that's the Amazon of China, that's the Yahoo of China. Uh, by the green is a little bit hard to say because the Chinese copycats have gotten better in, in some cases than their American counterparts. WeChat is better than um, WhatsApp. You use both, right? Um, Weibo is better than Twitter, right? Maybe not in the diversity of content, <laughs> but, but certainly in the quality of the product, okay? Um, Meituan is better than Yelp. Zhihu, our investment, proudly, is better than Quora. 
Um, so, and the list goes on. That's the green second step. The third step, the orange step, is where the Chinese leap one step forward and started to innovate. I won't even begin to tell you, those of you who are not Chinese, what each of the products does. Uh, what I can guarantee you is, uh, if I could have five minutes to explain each one to you and show it to you, you would say, wow, that's useful. I could use that, or I would know some people who could use that, and that's innovative. But those are all Chinese innovations. None of them have any American inspiration. So I think the American Silicon Valley, Ma Valley mindset is that once you've copied, once a copycat, always a copycat. But the reality is, when China had such tiny penetration of the internet, you have to be a copycat to get started. If you're always a copycat, you get nowhere. But if from copycatting once, twice, um, in some cases three times, four times, uh, <coughs> you learn so much about building products, you actually begin to innovate. Um, think about the time Google came out. US internet penetration, 30%. China, 0.2%. So how is a Chinese entrepreneur going to get anywhere without the copycatting? And a little caveat, internet, the copycatting I mean here is not I stealing IP. It's more like what Facebook did to Snapchat. Okay. So it is frowned upon in certain circles, but it's not illegal. So Chinese innovation have gotten to a point where people are copying from China. These are some examples of those same companies I don't have time to tell you about, but these are the value that they're worth. And I think I forgot to put and financial, which is worth $100 billion. So huge <laughs> amount of uh, value on this slide. Now that um, the companies are innovative, of course, behind them are the entrepreneurs who are tenacious, phenomenal in raising money and building amazing products. Um, in fact, I think the Chinese entrepreneurs have come up with brand new methods of innovation. Not only are the companies innovative, but 10 years from now, Harvard Business School will be studying the Silicon Valley method of innovation and the Chinese model of innovation. Uh, the two are very different. Silicon Valley is a light bulb goes off, technology is great, keep it light, uh, small company, all technology. Chinese company is, well, there are lots of copycats around us, so let's build a product that is absolutely impregnable and impossible to copy. So some of you are asking, how can a product be impossible to copy? Well, make the barrier so, 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 so high. Uh, so those of you who study Chinese history, uh, the famous Chinese uh, emperor, uh, Zhu Yanzhang, he said, the way to win is build high walls, um, hoard grain, and bid time until you declare yourself the emperor. And that is the magic formula. I'll give you a quick example because um, I think this is business relevant. Uh, an example of Yelp, which build a layer over the way people eat in the US. Very nice, but simple technology layer. Chinese Yelp, Meituan, they deliver food to your home. And they do it with such tenacity they set out a goal, I'm going to deliver food to almost everybody. So let's say 600 million Chinese people's homes will deliver to your home within 30 minutes that you order, uh, including the cooking time. <laughs> and if we're late, you don't have to pay. And, it, and the delivery charge, the cost to make that delivery, 70 cents. That's what it's going to take because that's what the Chinese consumers are willing to pay. So it sounds impossible, but the Chinese entrepreneurs' tenacity is all about overcoming the impossible. So how do you get to 70 cents? Well, first get to $2.70, and then grind down a few cents a month until you get there. And what if you run out of money? Get more from VCs. How do you know you can get there? You don't, but you just keep going. You come <laughs> up with technical uh, ideas, like uh, you know, AI algorithms for routing, right? You also come up with a lot of ugly, but um, uh, operational detail excellence ideas. So how do you find the lowest paid people who will deliver the food for you? Well, find 600,000 people who will work for the minimum wage and then use very clever ways to entice them to work, such as the reverse of surge pricing, right? Nobody's too, ma too many boxes in this restaurant. Well, okay, guess what? Your wage went up to $2 an hour from $1.50. Who will work now? Still not enough, $2.50. So this is the reverse search pricing. <laughs> and how do you hire and train 600,000 people who are working at below factory worker wages and still maintain a decent level of customer experience? I mean, that is a huge headache. Seems impossible, but they did it. And how do you get down to 70 cents? You, you can't use cars. Uber Eats is the fancy American way of approaching the problem. You have to use electrical bicycles. 
those are the cheapest. And we'll use the cheapest kind. The cheapest kind battery runs out in two hours. What happens? Well, you come up with battery replacement stations. So these are the steps that Meituan went through to go from 270 down to 70 cents. What if they failed? What if they ended up at 170 and couldn't bring it down anymore? Well, they're doing 25 million orders a day. So if you're at $1.70, you lose $25 million a day. So now you understand the operational excellence, the willingness to take risk, the willingness to make the project so heavy, and that's why Meituan is worth $50 billion. And also, it has built a gigantic high wall that if Alibaba now wants to replicate this, uh, they have a huge problem to overcome. Arguably impossible for anyone except Alibaba. And I'll make you a bet, Alibaba is going to give it a try. And that is the tenacious environment in which Chinese entrepreneurs work, then these are the entrepreneurs that we fund. So back to AI, China has a lot more uh, AI funding, more than US, 48% to China's third, uh, to US is 38%. <clears throat> is that all private? Uh, does that include government? That is uh, not all private. It would include government. What percentage is government? I don't have a breakdown, but for 2017, probably not very much. For 2018, maybe a bit more. Um, total government guiding funds is about 28 billion, so it's not that gigantic. Uh, but there are, to be uh, complete, there are new uh, uh, you know, uh, national uh, funds that have just been created, and they have a lot of money, and uh, that may tilt the picture. But uh, this picture is still largely private. <coughs> Why is iFly Tech on the bottom of that? Oh, okay. So on the right-hand side, I, I skipped that. The right-hand side shows iFlyTech versus Nuance, two speech recognition company, top two in the world. The Chinese company has gone up from a third of Nuance's value to twice of Nuance's value in the last um, um, some five, five years or so. Uh, that's not that basically is, is saying that Chinese stock market actually values AI companies uh, at a premium. So. China's AI capital leads the world, and just Sinovation Ventures, that is my company, we have invested in five unicorns, uh, and uh, they are now worth $21 billion. And this is just us. There are probably 10 other unicorns in China, just in AI. These are not some internet company also called AI. These are all core AI companies. So are, that's what- Are any cash flow positive? Uh, yes, Bitmain made about a billion US dollars last year but not from AI. <laughs> they use the Already same based on AI, cash flow positive. No. Um, no, no. Uh, uh, Face++ plus plus may be close. Uh, Bitmain uh, builds the same chip for uh, Bitcoin mining and, a and not same, similar architecture for bit mi Bitcoin mining and AI acceleration. The former is cash flow very, very positive. The latter is a uh, new product. <clears throat> uh, but I think feel free, if you feel this is an um, inflated valuation, that's a fair statement. But I think the inflated valuation gives these people very deep pockets so that um, they can use it to grow their business, buy other companies, and uh, even if the price comes down, they can still uh, survive through the winter. So, I, so I'm just using- Are these all China listed or are they, they are NASDAQ? All, they're or? all private companes. None, oh, they're none private are, None are listed. Huh. Uh, only Bitmain is now ready for listing in Hong Kong. Question? Uh, why is Bitmain also so high? Why is uh, so high? Oh, oh the multiple is uh, based on how much money we've made. We've made 72 times on Base++ plus plus because we invested very early at the angel round. It's not- Oh, that, a that's, a multi that's your profits. Yes, we, the, the money we made on behalf of our LPs went up 72 times in Face++ plus plus, and about 10 to 20 times on the other investments. Do you list the ones that went to zero? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't. We, we have no AI companies that have gone to zero. Really? Wow. Over all investments, we have about 10% that have gone to zero. I think if you let all the funds run to the end, probably a third will go to zero. Yeah. But that's, that's the nature of it. That's remarkably low percentage that go to zero. It, it is. I think when you talk to folks in Silicon Valley, they yep. will say 90% will go to zero and 10% will be 50 to 100 times, so they'll do fine. That's correct. Um, 
on the one hand, we're very proud because we're, we're very um, detail-oriented and technical, so we don't uh, make mistakes, as, as many mistakes. On the other hand, uh, what ultimately drives the return is, though, is whether you have you know, two unicorns or three. That drives the return much more than if you have 30% death or 60% death because the non-unicorns bring only modest return to the portfolio. So uh, we actually want to shoot for more unicorns rather than more caution. Unicorn is a company valued at one billion US dollars or more. Yeah. Okay, so this, uh, uh, the whole point of these two slides are, is to show AI is pour, China is pouring lots of money into AI. Okay. Not necessarily it's um, worth this much. Uh, and that number four key issue is that we're in just the transitional phase going from early adopter, which is technology oriented, PhD, superstar, academician leading the company, uh, typical example, DeepMind. Um, if that were the stage we're in, uh, US will outdo China probably 10 to 1 because there are probably 10 times as many AI superstars in the US as there are in China. But AI is getting easier. Um, uh, AI students are able to build pretty good systems based on open source uh, code. So we have entered on the right side, the uh, application phase, where what matters is you understand what's your application, how do you use AI, how does it create value. You're going to have more of a triangular leadership of a business person as a CEO, a solution product person, understanding customers, and then a CTO is your AI expert. And, when you, and who doesn't have to be a world superstar uh, researcher, but has to be a very competent AI engineer. And that combination, come, there are a lot in China. China probably has 10 times more than the US. And that's where the earlier entrepreneurial, tenacious entrepreneur skill comes into the right-hand side, giving China a, uh, an advantage. So in the early phase, US has advantage. In the application phase, China has an advantage. Now you could ask, will there be another breakthrough? If there's another breakthrough, are we back to uh, early stage? Yes. So we'll see when there's another breakthrough. Um, it's very hard to speculate, but I think breakthroughs are about once every decade. So uh, we may be due for one, but there won't be a lot of them. Okay, so advantage number five is really about data. As I mentioned, the more data, the, more, um, the, the better the AI. And in the age of AI, data is new, new oil, and China is the new Saudi Arabia and China has more data in depth and in breadth. Breadth is the number of users, depth is the number of transactions per user, such as I mentioned um, the use of um, uh, mobile payments, <coughs> such as the ordering of takeouts, such as riding uh, shared bicycles. Those are not just three times more, but 10 times more, 50 times more, 300 times more. And, all, and more data and more users per data, uh, sorry, more data per user gives Chinese companies an advantage to mining more, to have better AI. And finally, the uh, policy, Chinese policies. Uh, a lot of people in the media and politicians here portray Chinese policies as unfairly advantaging Chinese companies. Um, while that may be true in a few small cases, in AI that is really not true at all. There are three ways in which Chinese policies help companies. One is the left-hand side, the State Council AI plan. That is basically setting a tone. With that tone set, Chinese banks are more open to using buying AI software. Uh, Chinese um, uh, provinces and cities are more willing to figure out what they might do with AI. But what they do is up to them, not central government um, uh, determined. Uh, a city might say, we have lots of uh, good universities. Let's uh, double up on our research funding. A city might say, we're good in manufacturing. Let's add AI to manufacturing. Or a city might say, well, we're a pretty poor city. We don't have anything that can use AI. Let's focus on improving poverty. So it's fairly uh, empowered at the city level. But uh, clearly, the central party sets a tone that, uh, to the extent that you can, do something useful with AI. So it's, it, that's kind of the setting tone part. The second part is about um, uh, uh, bu uh, building infrastructure. So pri China actually lets private companies do much of the early stage investments. And China will do things that private industry cannot do, such as building a new city, Xiong'an, the size of Chicago, for autonomous driving, such as in Xiong'an's downtown center, create two layers of um, road. Top layer is for pedestrians uh, and pets and bicycles. Bottom layer is for automobiles. 
that reduces accidents, such as the province of Zhejiang, which is building highways with sensors that will help autonomous vehicles um, get, not get off the road. Uh, contrast that with American policies, though. Um, the, uh, the currently autonomous trucks cannot be tested on American highways because of um, truckers' union feeling that would uh, impact their employment, which it would, but I think as far as national priority, uh, it would seem staying ahead in autonomous automobiles is more strategic. Uh, the money made in that industry probably can help the truckers find new jobs, but nevertheless, that one country which is ahead is pulling back its AI, one country which is behind has infrastructures pushing forward. The third part is the title of this slide, techno-utilitarian Chinese policies. What does that mean? It means the Chinese government will let some policies um, be tried for a while, see how it goes. Uh, in Chinese, uh, there's a phrase called, let the bullet fly a little bit. <laughs> let it fly a little bit. If it doesn't hit anybody, go forward. <laughs> if it hits someone, regulate it. Okay, so that's kind of the approach. It's a very entrepreneurial approach. So, you know, the mobile payment that I talked about, that's replace cash and credit cards in China, uh, they let the bullet fly a little bit. Uh, obviously, banks and credit cards will cry foul and say, whoa, software companies like Alibaba and Tencent, they can't be trusted to manage money. We've been doing this for 100 years. You let software companies do this, they'll be too powerful, plus they'll screw up and then there'll be hackers and all kinds of problems. But the government said, let's see. And then Alibaba and Tencent proved their worth. And, and now they pretty much are eating the banks and credit cards lunch as everybody uses mobile payment. But the government is not always uh, hands off uh, in the case of cryptocurrency. When we started seeing you know, uh, vil older, old, uh, old lady in a village buying ICOs, okay? <laughs> government said, oh, that may be time to regulate. So they regulated that. So it's not always unregulated. It's just carefully watched. And that has certain advantages in the case of uh, AI. So if we have to measure where China stands with US, I think very roughly speaking, China is a bit behind the US in the implementation, but we'll get ahead of US uh, in five years, very roughly speaking. Uh, it depends on which area. In business AI, US will stay ahead because of uh, the more advanced enterprise software and data warehousing. Uh, but generally speaking, China should be ahead of US in Im implementation, valuation, and monetization of AI over the next five years. Now I want to step back and say that uh, there is no zero-sum game. These graphs are drawn because Everyone needs to see them, otherwise I can't finish my talk. Uh, but the, in fact, the fact is Chinese VCs fund Chinese companies who build products for Chinese people. American VCs fund American companies who build products for the developed world. There is no zero-sum game. The fact that one of these companies expands the business, makes more money, it does not mean the US company would make less money. So at the commercial level, there's absolutely no zero-sum game. And um, now with US and China dual engine, uh, you obviously AI will be accelerated because um, previous uh, technology revolutions have gone very fast, PC, internet, mobile, all driven by one engine. Now we got two engines. And that will lead to um, AI as electricity empowering a lot of things. And uh, AI communities are very open, very willing to share. And AI will create tremendous wealth, about 15.7 trillion, estimated by PwC by the year 2030. And roughly speaking, that's the size of GDP of China plus India. So it's a hu huge uh, addition. But at the same time, AI will cause a lot of challenges. Privacy, we've heard a lot about that. Security, what if people hack into autonomous automobiles and turn them into weapons? Bias from data, dominance of monopolistic giants, Wealth, growing wealth inequality. And finally, and I think most importantly, job displacement. Because if we look at all the jobs, it's happening, already happening everywhere. We see blue collar jobs displaced, we see, we see white collar job displaced. Because AI is that single precocious superstar that can do one task very well. And there are many people whose job is one task. That di displacement will come both in the center case where it, you see a machine displacing a cashier. That machine, unlike Amazon Go, uh, $10 million, that machine is $800. And we invest in the company that built the machine. It's recognizing pastry uh, in one shot, no, not one scan at a time. Take the whole tray, you've all been to 
croissant shops, pastry shop. Take the whole tray, put it under, and it charges your WeChat account immediately. So one-to-one -one displacement. Left-hand side is a fast food uh, joint called F5 Future Store. That is a robotic store, a robotic restaurant. And as you can see, there are no people working in it. You go in, it recognizes your face. You, use, you, you point on the screen what you want to eat, beef noodle, um, fish ball soup, salad, whatever, and then um, it makes the food in the back. The back is uh, actually the, this part, this part of the, uh, of the, of the restaurant. It's invisible. It's, it's not actually a robot with arms and legs. It's just a giant machine that has a steamer, a, a, a you know, boiler, a, an oven, microwave, and so on, and, and little arms that move things around. So um, that in itself is not displacing workers directly. However, uh, if this kind of restaurant takes over half, 50% share in the restaurant market, well, other restaurants will be squeezed and half the jobs will be gone. Okay, so white collar works similarly. City has issued a warning of um, uh, displacing 10,000 people out of 20,000 in its operational staff due to AI and automation. Uh, and also we have things like news, uh, news, <coughs> news feed from Facebook and the Toteau from China that has, is very addictive. While no self-respecting media would ever use a robot for an, to be an editor, these are, robot, uh, <laughs> these are robotic companies that have pure AI editing the stories or picking the stories. So if the total readership in the world is 50% switched over to these non-humanly edited magazines and um, uh, content, then half the editors will also lose their jobs. So the displacement is not just one-to-one, -one, but it could be through industry, um, industry level disruptions. So what about, so with all those disruptions, are all our jobs gone? I think some pessimists would say, all our jobs will be replaced, we're in trouble. Some optimists would say, oh no, it's human machine, human AI symbiosis will be one plus one equals three. Well, I'll tell you they're both wrong and they're both right. Uh, it depends on what jobs you're talking about. And I'm gonna show you a simple-minded, a simple blueprint. So what are the two things that uh, AI cannot do? One is creativity, but also can be extended to creativity, strategy, out-of-box thinking, um, um, common sense reasoning and the planning and things like that. So the more uh, complex and creative, more, the, the more on the right side. The more non-creative, more on the left side. There is one other thing that machines cannot do, which is compassion. And that is um, the trust that we have with humans, with one another, the communication, um, the uh, compassion, the empathy. And we could they make that the uh, y-axis uh, with high compassion empathy to low compassion empathy. So if we divide all jobs into four quadrants, the lower left side will completely be AI replaced. The low compassion, low creativity. The lower right side will be AI tool to make the human created people even more creative. That will be symbiosis, making the scientists discover more drugs per day of work. The upper left will be AI tool for analysis used by human who wraps warmth around it. Think about it as a, uh, a great AI tool for a cancer diagnosis used by a doctor who comforts and understands patients and gives them confidence that uh, they're gonna be okay and visits them at home. So that's a symbiosis. And then the right hand upper side is of course human uh, dominate but with AI helping it. So you'll see in each quadrant the answer is different. This is a blueprint that I think will help us think about job displacement. Lower left gets displaced in which quadrant can those people be retrained and moved to? Not the upper right, not the lower right. It's got to be the upper, upper left. And upper left are jobs like nurses, nannies, teachers, compassionate caregivers, elderly caregivers. Uh, those jobs need to be invested in and expanded in order to retrain the displaced routine workers from the lower left side. So I think all those things are not going to come by AI. AI will take those jobs away, but AI will not quickly enough create enough new jobs. The AI jobs that are created cannot be easily taken by the routine workers. The AI jobs created are data scientists, robot re repair people, not so easy <laughs> to be retrained, right? Um, but, but we need to create those jobs. So we, as humans, need to solve these problems, and there are solutions throughout the world we can connect together. So in the past um, 
30, whoops, a little longer, <laughs> 40 minutes I've talked about <clears throat> in the next 20 years. AI will bring tremendous value and wealth. It will disrupt the job marketplace, but we can solve it if we work together and create enough jobs. But if we look a little further at 50 years out and look back, I think it'll be a very different picture. Because by then, I think we will think about AI as an era of human enlightenment. Um, for those of you who are religious, uh, our maker, for those of you who are not, our collective consciousness must be very, very disappointed at us. Because after thousands of years, we still take our work as the primary meaning of our life. And too many of us do just run on the wheel like a lab rat and don't think why we exist here. So that maker is probably so disappointed that he threw AI at us <laughs> and said, okay, if you can't figure this one out, I'm gonna take away all of your routine jobs. So in that sense, be thankful to AI, which is serendipity, because it will liberate us from routine work and push us into thinking, what makes us human. And lastly, I think if we think about threats from AI, remember, AI is just a tool. We set AI's goals. We as human, we are the AI's master. We are the only ones with free will. And we're going to be the ones who write the ending to the story of human and AI. Thank you. That was just terrific. Um, talk a little bit. You know, you say, so jobs where there's compassion, where there's human interaction, um, and kind of the different levels of development of, of China and the United States. And you mentioned teachers as something which would not be replaced by AI. I was a little surprised to hear that. And I think about, you know, the use of AI for elementary education and the difference between China and the United States. So one of my daughters is, a, is an elementary school educator. And I always talk with her, I, you know, and I say, couldn't a machine do what you do? And she says, no, not, not really, because of the compassion element. But then when I talk to Chinese friends in the same, <coughs> um, you know, we had a visit from Lumai, who works on, um, uh, early education throughout China. It's not a question of comparing in China, so you compare it to the United States, it's not a question of comparing the education that a Chinese gets in elementary school because they don't have teachers in many mm -hmm. cases. Whereas in the United States, there are very few places that you don't. So isn't China going to move to AI? Because it's not, you know, if you're in, in what did he say? I, Peggy, was it 20, 30, 40 million Chinese don't have access to proper education at the most basic level? Aren't, isn't China going to move to AI there because they don't have the ability to use human mm. teachers and they'll actually advance because of that? Uh, it's possible. A lot of the things that gave China an advantage is the late mover advantage. Right. Being right. late to the landline phones, being late to the credit cards gave China advantage. It could give China advantage in um, retail, um, health care, and education. Um, I, think, I think in China there are very interesting experiments being run. Uh, I'm actually on 60 Minutes either this Sunday or next Sunday in a segment about Chinese uh, education in, in AI. And uh, we use examples where uh, there aren't enough teachers for everybody, and the quality of teachers vary greatly from top-tier cities to the, to the villages. So some of the solutions we've worked with our portfolio companies to resolve was, can we get a star teacher to broadcast a lecture to a lot of schools, and then use maybe a clicker interface right. to maintain um, a connection? Can the local teachers be more compassionate teaching assistants? We also looked into can we help automate a lot of the work, uh, such as uh, grading of exams and homeworks, such as roll call? Can it be done by face recognition? Um, and, and a lot of these uh, things can be really um, enhanced by AI. A teacher's job is not all compassionate and certainly not all routine. It's probably, I don't know, 50% compassionate, 50% routine. And those routine parts can be, 
can be taken over by AI and so that the teacher can theoretically focus on the one-to-one, -one, the mentoring, the advice, the personal uh, targeted uh, help, the comforting, the encouragement. Uh, so I really hope by using AI to take away a portion of the teacher's job, uh, teachers can be more individually applied and there can be more teachers ultimately. And in America, uh, one could argue homeschooling may be a great thing for those who want to do it and maybe there should be subsidy for that. So I think we can extrapolate this idea, but I think teachers will definitely not go away and become more important, more compassionate, and maybe more of them. I want to open, because <coughs> I'm going to open, I see we have tons of hands. Let's start right here. Great, thank you, Steve. And then try to make them brief, because sure, we got a lot of folks. Very, very interesting. Good yep, it's good. Very interesting presentation, thank you. Um, so uh, with the investment of AI over the last few years, one of the hot topics was job creation. So you talked about that. Um, so in terms of create more creation for uh, compassion jobs, you know, shifting from the people displaced to the compassion jobs. Other than that, can you, I don't hear much talk about in terms of the new professions that will be created. Can you spend a little time talking about the new professions that will be created? And what are some of the <coughs> sort of key or hot uh, skill sets that's needed? New professions created as a result of AI and also skill sets needed for that new era. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think those are the most exciting jobs and the jobs that uh, if to the extent your children can possibly go, go for it. I think part of the future education will be the STEM education. Every kid should learn to program and those who are great uh, will be discovered and will become the biggest magnifier of um, economic value to the society. So I th that's very exciting. And, and, but it's not really not the panacea, I want to first point that out. I think a lot of Silicon Valley giants talk about, uh, don't worry about these jobs lost, there'll be so many other great jobs created by AI. I think if you hard press me or any of them, we probably can't come up with that many. Um, the ones I can come up with would be, you know, data scientists, uh, robot repair, um, good programmers, Python programmers, teachers of Python, and then I start to run out of things. And you know, I've hardly come up with two million jobs and then 200 million jobs are lost on the other side. Uh, in the long term, I am optimistic. If you give us human race 50 years, I think AI will create a lot of jobs. Just like before electricity, it would have been impossible to imagine all the jobs that became possible after electricity. And the moment electricity was invented, we probably still didn't know what jobs. So I really just don't know. And I think the Silicon Valley giants also don't know. Uh, what I do know is it will come over time and that there could be a lot of them, but uh, it's, it's going to take one disruption at a time before they, they come out. Right now, I can only project those few categories that are core AI engineering programming. I'm certain when AI meets medicine, when AI meets uh, CRISPR, when AI meets uh, biology, when AI meets uh, media, there will be many variations that are created. Um, I think another type that will be very big is uh, professions that are enabled, infused by AI. So if you're a reporter, now a reporter with the power of AI to access even more stuff. If you're an um, um, investment uh, advisor, if you're a um, um, uh, scientist or a columnist, I think those are the kinds of things that could happen. But it's kind of hard to project exactly the name of the profession. Just like 10 years ago, no one could tell you what their data scientists would be one of the hottest jobs today, but now it is. And I think there will be uh, 10 times as many such jobs in five years, maybe 100 times as many such job titles in, in 10 years. But um, by definition, we humans <laughs> don't know what they are until, uh, until the need arises. Right here. <coughs> right here and then here and then here. Uh, we know you run and in, identify yourself, please. Uh, my name is Pia Chen. Uh, we know you run a successful venture <coughs> capital. It's not on. Oh, hello. We know you run a successful venture capital and you invest a lot of um, technology and AI companies like Deepman and Facebook. 
take plasma. And so you make a resume in a very early stage company. So like those AI companies, there might be no comparable company. How do you decide the valuation of those early stage companies when you make a <coughs> angel's resume? Well, uh, there are usually early stage companies are usually defined by uh, uh, comparables. So look at other peers and what they're getting. And um, sometimes they could be uh, determined by the type of talent. So if you have three superstars from Google Brain come out uh, without hearing what they're doing, I can tell you they're going to be valued at higher than $30 million, right? So it's a little bit, um, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of black magic comparisons okay. and uh, who, the, the who. Um, but the, the, but the value, exact valuation is not that important. If, those, uh, if, if when we went into Face++, Plus Plus, uh, we negotiated a valuation, I forgot, 10, $12 million. Suppose we value, value it down to 10 million. So what? We got a little more return. If, we got, if, if they forced us to pay 20 million, so what? It's still a huge return. So I think the exact valuation is not super important. Um, from our side, that's what we look for. From the entrepreneur side, what they look for is um, how much do we need to spend over the next 18 months? And how much, what, what percentage of the company are we willing to give up? And you multiply those two, uh, you take the uh, amount you need and then you divide by the percentage uh, ownership you're willing to share, that's the valuation they want. So we have a number, they have a number, and then the rest is just like when you buy a house and you negotiate. <laughs> for your wonderful speech. Uh, I'm Rebecca, uh, a BD in executive of Kinesis. So um, since you have covered uh, four waves of AI development, my question will be about the AI rating. Uh, people have, have been talking about AI rating a lot. And AI do you think what? AI reasoning? AI reasoning. reasoning. Means AI would have critical thinking. Oh. And do you think AI reasoning will be a trend of wave five and how long uh, does it take, and, and also how it will be? Thank you. Well, depends on what you mean by reasoning. I think at a very superficial level, you could argue uh, a system that can make long determination is doing something re about reasoning. You can argue that a system that's looking at features of your face is doing some basic reasoning, but I imagine you mean human level intelligence? Yeah, it is. So when you when you're doing iris recognition, but right now uh, the, uh, uh, there's another product like uh, colored contact. It will cover your iris. If uh, if AI has reasoning, they can tell. Okay, this one is not human eyes. Is no, I, I don't think that's reasoning. No, I don't think that's reasoning. That's just uh, having more samples of data and then learning. Uh, uh, you know, um, I, I don't think that's reasoning. Uh, a reasoning would be um, explain to me why you came to this talk instead of uh, going to dinner with your boyfriend. That that's reasoning, <laughs> or um, you know, uh, causal analysis or human-like reasoning. Uh, another way to look at reasoning would be human intelligence. That everything we can do, they can do. Those are a little bit easier to. Uh, so I think the the most common. Um, measure is when do we reach human level performance that is truly past the Turing test. That is, you cannot tell that is a, an AI or a person by conversing with it in any domain you want. And if, you, if that's your question, I don't think that, I know that's your question, but if that were the question, I would say, well, I have no idea. I, ha I think we're very far from that. We have no engineering evidence that we can make any progress towards that. Uh, of course, magic happens. I mean, deep learning happens. So someone could come up with uh, you know, super deep learning or something else. Um, if you look at historically, in the 62 years of AI, we've had one giant breakthrough, deep learning, which was 10 years ago. We haven't had a big one yet. yet. Now you could say maybe we're due for one, but um, we're not, our track record is not exactly great. 62 years, one breakthrough. <laughs> so to expect, you know, to get to human level intelligence, I can probably count 20, 10 things we don't know how maybe requiring 10 breakthroughs. So I'm guessing human, truly human Turing equivalent human, indistinguishable from another human, including self-awareness and emotion, 
I'm going to guess more than 50 years. Uh, but, but I could be wrong. I mean, any, that's the whole idea of a breakthrough, is one breakthrough shakes up the whole thing. I'm, but I'm going to guess, based on my experience, uh, more than 50 years. One 30-second question, because we're out of time. So did you go into AI? <laughs> <laughs> I try my best. I try my best to keep my not lose the job, to use the AI strategy with my academic search. But right now, I want to add between the efficient and products. Well, right now, I just want to add Google. If Google have the dragonfly research engines, that's the new one. And they try to return the China market. So I want to add Okay. So Google CEO has denied that there are real plans to go to China. That's a purely um, research project that didn't materialize. Uh, so there's no, um, I can't speculate on something that Google CEO denied. Um, I can gen answer generally, uh, as you develop a product, you're always trading off. And as a user, you're always trading off privacy with convenience. And I think, um, I, I do agree that privacy is incredibly important, especially to Western culture, also important to Eastern culture, but more important to Western culture. Uh, but I think it's important not to single-mindedly say, oh, privacy, 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 you can't have all that. Because if everybody goes like that, all the conveniences are suddenly gone, you're, and you're back into 1980. So that is the trade-off you have. I do believe, over time, that uh, the, in, the, in the wisdom in, in the various governments will come up with ways for people to opt out if they don't want the convenience to protect their privacy. And, um, and that for the most people, I think we will gradually learn to give up parts or most of our privacy in order to get the conveniences. I think we're kind of at a, in a road of no return. Uh, if, if people are asked to give up all the conveniences now, um, as much as we all say we want privacy, we don't want this, we don't want that, uh, I think most people are going to be unable to, uh, to go back to 1980. So that, that's a very tricky trade-off, and, and, and I think ultimately the answer will actually be a crowdsourcing. It will be crowdsourced to all governments in the world to come up with all the different trade-offs, and all companies in the world to come up with the different trade-offs. Uh, Euro European Union came up with the first one called GDPR. I think it is a terrible, uh, design. However, I think it is great that someone started that. And now we just need more countries to try things. At some point, maybe we'll find something that, ah, if I could do that, I can have a knob of privacy and convenience. Now I think too much of the talk is, no, 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 don't take my privacy, without realizing how much convenience you have.